Hello, my name is Father C. John McCloskey. I'm the director of the Catholic Information Center, the Archdiocese of Washington, and a priest of the Prelature of Opus Dei. Welcome to another episode of our EWTN series dedicated to exploring the life, work, and thought of the Venerable Cardinal John Henry Newman. Today's guest is Father Ian Carr. We're delighted to have him back once again. Father Carr is a priest of the Diocese of Portsmouth in England. He is a renowned Newman scholar who's written many volumes on Venerable John Henry, of many of which are in print, which we highly recommend here on this series. He's also a tutor at Campion Hall of the Jesuit Fathers, uh, which is located at uh, Oxford University. He received his a terminal degree, his doctorate in English literature at Cambridge University. And today he's going to speak to us about the influence of the Venerable John Henry on, most particularly on the Second Vatican Council. Welcome back again, Father Carr. Um, and I said mainly on the influence of John Henry Newman on the Second Vatican Council, which we'll spend most of our time together. But I also wanted to bring up a more interesting and somewhat contentious question. How about John Henry Newman and the First Vatican Council, which was a council that took place in his lifetime? Yes, well, they say that um, those two Vatican councils, 19th and 20th century, were both dominated by Englishmen, by two English cardinals, uh, one by Cardinal Manning, the great proponent of um, the definition of papal infallibility, and then by Newman as the absent father of, mm -hmm. Vatican, of the Second Vatican Council. Um, Newman was invited to attend the First Vatican Council as a paritus, but declined to do so on the grounds that he, well, that he wasn't any good at committees, he wasn't that kind of person, and also he didn't feel that he was really a, um, a theologian in the sense in which the Catholic Church really understood the, that word in those days, that he wasn't a trained scholastic theologian, although he was now. In hindsight, we see him as the greatest Catholic theologian of the 19th century. Um, he, he didn't feel that he had the sort of technical expertise that was needed for that kind of work. He was also, of course, out of sympathy with the, um, the ultramontane uh, drive that was behind that council. Um, the, the, the ultramontanes who wanted the Pope's infallibility to be defined in, in far more, in, in a much more, um, much less moderate way than it was actually defined at the council. He would have identified himself more with people like uh, Dupont Loop of France, yes. a more moderate or, or liberal, under, under, not saying heterodox, but liberal tendency. Well, the inopportunists, as they were called. That's to say, people who didn't say that papal infallibility wasn't a doctrine. Because, in fact, Newman said that he, he thought the church had always acted upon it, and he believed it as an Anglican, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, but he just didn't think it was opportune at the time. And particularly, of course, he was very worried about uh, some of the extreme kinds of uh, um, understanding of what that would entail amounted to. Now, isn't it true that he wrote some very strong sermons re regarding the papacy as a Catholic that would almost read as ultramontane in terms of their approach? That is, once the, 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 the dogma of infallibility was proclaimed, that he adhered to it, regardless yes. of whatever he thought its opportunity was at, at that um, moment. Yes, I mean, he, it's, it's true that when he, was, uh, when he read the idea of university um, in, the, uh, in 1851, in the early 1850s, he um, he was a recent convert, and he thought later on that he'd rather exaggerated the, the sagacity of popes. You know, he thought the pope had probably made a mistake in, mm -hmm. in telling the Irish bishops to start the Catholic University of Ireland. So uh, I think at the beginning he did sort of somehow feel the pope was in, almost infallible in everything he did. And, of course, he, he modified that view and understood that popes make mistakes and so mm -hmm. on and don't always judge the situation correctly. Um, but that, uh, of course, when they, when they do speak in very solemn and special moments about what is the faith of the church, then the Holy Spirit will protect them from saying something which is not the faith of the church. Which we could almost call indefectibility as yes, well as uh, yes. infallibility. Yes. Perhaps uh, having heard about the very small, inf well, we would not say influence necessarily, but connection that, that the Venerable John Henry had with the First Vatican Council, we can now talk about uh, as you refer to him as the absent father. And I can't remember, and I'm sure you'll be able to tell me, but I, as I remember, the Cardinal Newman was cited perhaps in the preparatory documents of the Second Vatican Council more than any other single theologian. I think it was more in the, his name was mentioned more in debates, I think, on from the council floor, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, his name, I don't think there's any, there's no citation of him actually 
in mm. the Second Vatican. There is in the Catechism, of course. There are four citations in the Catechism. That yes, mm -hmm. but not in the Council itself. But the, in the in, uh, but the, but of course he was mentioned a number of times. Mm -hmm. And he himself said after Vatican I to people who were very worried by what had happened and thought that the, the Church had committed, you know, what was going to be the implications of this definition. Newman always said there will be another Council which in itself was a, a rather radical thing to say because after Vatican I many people believed that there never would be another council because there would never be a need for another one. After all, most councils or the great councils had been called to answer heresies. Well, now the Pope had been declared infallible so he could deal with the matter himself. It wouldn't be necessary <laughs> <laughs> to have a council. And, and indeed we know that the, when Pope John XXIII announced that he was calling the council at St. Paul outside the walls, um, the, the, the cardinals there were, I think uh, Osservatore Romano said they were, um, uh, they, they fell into a, some sort of, um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, it was put very politely, but in fact the Pope really uh, was aware of the fact they were sort of scandalized <laughs> by the thought. You know, what on the earth is he doing calling a council? But Newman believe, said there will be another council. Yeah, I believe that the first Vatican Council, in fact, was never officially closed. It was no. suspended so in a certain sense. Well, and, and, and providentially, really, you see, mm. because had they continued, with they, they, they passed Pastor Aeternus, but had they produced the, the, the whole teaching document on the church which had been intended, we would have got a very different kind of constitution on the church from mm -hmm. that which we got at Vatican II. Mm -hmm. And it would not it would have been very different indeed, very much more like of course the schema that was originally proposed at the beginning of Vatican II which the car which the bishops rejected. Mm -hmm. Well maybe we can look at various areas and, and you can explain uh, to some extent Cardinal Newman's thought on the area but also how it re became reflected in one way or another mm -hmm. in the in the conciliar <coughs> documents. I know a particular interest of yours is ecclesiology, mm. which is, really lies at the very heart of, of many of the documents of, mm. of the Council. Who, who are we as a church? Mm. And perhaps you could uh, expatiate a little bit on that for us. Yes, I mean all the practically all the documents of the Council, exception of the one on uh, Revelation, are really all about the church, aren't they? I mean they're about the church in its internal structures. They're about the church in its relations with other Christians, with non-Christians, with the modern world. And, and so the, the council is, it was essentially a council about the church and therefore it is fairly obvious it seems to me that the, the key document must be the document in which the council reflects actually upon the nature of the church itself. That document which we normally call a Lumen Gentium by the first two Latin words. Um, and, and I think that the first two chapters, as I said in the previous program of yours, the first two chapters of that constitution are the real magna carta uh, for the for the for the Vatican II Church. You know that um, into the new era in which we're passing, and here we find I'm not saying a direct influence of Newman, except that the theologians who drafted those chapters were profoundly aware of Newman. And what we're really seeing in those first two chapters, of course, is, is a um, recovery of scriptural and patristic ecclesiology. And it was something that Newman had himself already discovered as an Anglican when he realized that the, what the essence of the church was, that it is the mystical body of Christ, that it is the, the communion of those baptized in the Holy Spirit. That, that is the essence of the church. And the council begins with that, the church as a, as a mystery of Christ, the sacrament of salvation. And not in, in the usual institutional Tridentine terms of seeing the church uh, with the pyramid model, the hierarchical model. The term c communion is very interesting because it's a very lively concept in the work of mm. Lubach or von Balthasar yes, yes. or many other strong faithful theologians of this century, that idea of communio. Mm. Could you talk a little bit more about that or, or how that would be different from a, a strictly hierarchical vision of the church that might have existed in, in really up to the Second Vatican Council? Well, it, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a communio in the, in the sense in which when Paul defines the church, he says, in to, to a couple of places, doesn't he? He says, apostles first. The church is certainly hierarchical. There's no question about that. Uh, our Lord uh, set um, the apostles at the head of his church and, and put one of them as a senior apostle. Um, and, and the Vatican Council, the Second Vatican Council, is quite clear about this. But it, it makes it clear that the hierarchic and the charismatic gifts both come from the same Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, it's not as if some people are isolated all by themselves. These people are all part of this communio, this circle, except people have different gifts. Mm -hmm. And it's not a question of saying, uh, you say apostles first. It doesn't necessarily mean the apostles are the most important. I think we've got to be careful here, because it would be rather like saying, who is more important, Our Lady, Mary, or St. Peter? 
And, and it's, a, it's an absurd question to it's ask. Apples and oranges. Eh? Yes. As in terms of the leadership of the church, St. Peter's more important. Mm -hmm. Or St. John represents love, which is who is more important. He wasn't made head of the church, but he was closest to our Lord. And I think it's this kind of, this is what we mean when we talk about communia. We're talking about people in this communion who all share the one baptism, the one faith, and who have different charisms and gifts. Mm -hmm. Well, as a side or along with uh, his ecclesiology, uh, probably most of us in the United States uh, who are familiar with Cardinal Newman oftentimes hear about him in reference to Newman clubs, which were the particular mm. camp, what we call today or oftentimes call campus ministry. Mm. But when we think or hear of Newman, normally ecumenism is what comes to mind, mm. and particularly post-Vatican II, ecumenism, the ecumenical movement, and oftentimes Newman is put forth as the great ecumenist. Could you explain a little, perhaps, what ecumenism truly means as opposed to what some people might think it means and how Newman was a great ecumenist. Um, yes, uh, I, I think that Newman I think that Newman was, was dimly aware of the, of the big breakthrough made by Catholic theologians really in this century which is that that all the baptized must have some relationship to the church. They must in some way partake of the church. One faith, one Lord, one baptism. One baptism. So uh, it, it is obvious that even those outside, visibly outside the church have some sort of partial membership of the church. And until the Catholic Church could say that, any real talk of EQ, any ecumenical talk was really, uh, was really out of the question. Now Newman I think understood that. He understood that, that people had, that we shared this baptism and that we should start from that kind of position from the most fundamental things that we share. Uh, that, uh, that was always his approach. And I believe myself that in the century in which we're living, some of the most fruitful ecumenical endeavors that I know of are precisely where people have done that. Where, in other words, where, for example, had been uh, alliances formed between Catholics and evangelicals in this country over fundamental moral issues. Yeah, evangelical Catholics together. Exactly. Yeah. And also, I think one sees some very interesting fruitful exchanges between uh, Protestant and Catholic charismatics, yeah. where they both have the same belief in the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and from that they can begin to develop an understanding between each other. Mm -hmm. So that a Protestant, may, uh, Protestant charismatic, evangelical charismatic, will begin to understand what we mean by sacraments in terms of the Holy Spirit, or understanding what we mean by Mariology in terms of the Holy Spirit. And so that a dialogue becomes possible because one's both start, one's starting from the same fundamental point of view, rather than starting with the really difficult thing, saying well, let's just talk about papal infallibility, mm -hmm. in which case we probably won't get anywhere. Mm -hmm. And Newman was a great believer in starting at the bottom, starting with the things we do share. The somewhat controversial, in some ways perhaps the most controversial document of the, um, of the Council, which continues to um, cause problems for some people, is a proper understanding of what we mean by religious freedom, mm -hmm. religious liberty. In fact, we had a, a, a schism with um, Archbishop Lefebvre in part on account of that. In certain yes. sense, almost, almost more than the question of, of liturgy, I think. Yes, it was for him. Yes. And um, Newman, of course, had a terrific understanding of freedom, and I'll let you explain, but I, I do think in, in part because he's a man who suffered a lot by people who were really intolerant on matters that were opinionable inside of the church. But uh, explain that concept of how, you, and perhaps introducing, this is the first time we've brought up this word during yes. all our broadcast, conscience. Yes, we haven't talked <laughs> about that. And understood in a proper sense, how does yes. the, the role of the conscience in religious freedom and liberty well, Newman was very well aware of the classic Catholic tradition of the sovereignty of conscience. After all, St. Thomas Aquinas, the theologian par excellence of the church, had said that people must follow their conscience, even if it led them outside the church. If they, that was what their conscience told them, erroneous as it might be, it was their duty to obey their conscience. So Newman had a profound sense of this, because he saw that ultimately faith depends on following our conscience. He used, didn't he use the conscience as one of the proofs of God. Exactly. Mm -hmm. This is where he, so what, where he began philosophically always with, with the conscience as the aboriginal vicar of Christ. The Pope mm -hmm. is called the vicar of Christ, mm -hmm. but the aboriginal vicar of Christ, which every person, human being has, mm -hmm. whether they're Christian or not. And so there's another example where Newman anticipates the Second Vatican Council on the question of salvation outside the church. Because for Newman, everyone has this primordial revelation given to them in terms of their conscience, which is where God, first of all, offers them the chance of salvation. The Newman was very well aware of that very early on. Um, the other thing I think that was very important for Newman was this, this sense, this very pragmatic, historical sense he had. He saw that the Catholic Church 
was 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 in, in was putting itself in a anachronistic situation um, in denying people religious freedom. That is to say. That, that if you impose Catholicism in a country where the faith of the people were no longer supporting it, the church could end up in a worse situation than it was before. In, in other words, that the, the, the church had to be, the, 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 to insist on the establishment of Catholicism, um, where the faith of the people wasn't supporting it sufficiently, would in the end damage the church. And, and so I think that he would have been delighted, would have seen the, 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 the wisdom after the Second Vatican Council of the church distancing itself from the state in, in traditional Catholic countries, where all too often the church had been involved in a kind of unholy alliance with the state, where the church in return for privileges, um, support for Catholic schools and so on, would turn a blind eye to all kinds of, um, uh, you know, um, uh, offences against uh, human rights and so on. Mm -hmm. Because it, was, it seems to me one of the most profound changes that's taken place in the Catholic Church, and we owe this, I really ask, to the Second Vatican Council, is, is the way the papacy has changed. Because in the 19th century, the papacy in the Catholic Church was, was considered a force of reaction. I mean, uh, and here we have in the 20th century, the Pope going around to these different countries and dictatorships falling in front of him. Being nominated for the Nobel yes. Peace Prize, for example. Well, to somebody in the 19th century, that would have been quite incredible. Mm -hmm. So we could say that he, while not denying the, in a more perfect world where the state would recognize the church. Yes, yes. But the, re but the reality he, he would want to recognize the reality and exercise the virtue of prudence. Exactly. Putting the emphasis more on religious freedom, respecting people's conscience, mm. and winning them over by the normal means of prayer and sacrifice and friendship yes. and personal yes. influence and, and it's something that would happen naturally over time to where you would get to the extent there would be no need for mm. the state necessarily. And of course he would also have said that the, uh, as you, you write, quite rightly said, that it was the Declaration on Religious Freedom which was most upsetting to someone like Archbishop Lefebvre. Of course it didn't worry um, English-speaking Catholics because they depended upon it mm. in the United States and England places that we depend on the, being tolerated by Protestants. Mm -hmm. uh, so it didn't shock us in the same way, but, but, but for a continental Catholic who'd been brought up to believe that error has no rights, it was profoundly shocking. But here, of course, we have a classic case of Newman's doctrine of development, theory of development. Because here we have development, not change, where the church says, yes, it's perfectly true, error has no rights, but that doesn't mean that those in error don't have right, don't have rights. The people don't have rights. Where a distinction is made and is therefore possible for the church without denying what it said before, but to move into a new position. And that certainly has made ecumenical relations much more feasible because yes. people in understanding that and listening to it realize that we're not, that this expression goes, we are here to propose, the church proposes but does not impose. Yes. And that's not what the aim is of the church. Mm. It offers itself Hmm. with grace and understanding, with great hope that there will be an eventual reunion. And again, an example of renewal, of going back to the sources, because here, because this after all, is what we see in the Gospels. Mm -hmm. Precisely what we see, our Lord never impels anyone, mm -hmm. never compels anyone. He offers people. They choose to move away, He, he lets them. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you could talk a little bit uh, about what is referred to as the ressourcement, the, um, the going back or the retrieval of the, of the ancient fathers. Mm. Uh, it's clear that, and we've explored this in other programs, that Newman certainly would never be described as a Thomist. No. Uh, he, he wasn't overly familiar in a strict scholastic teaching of all the th things of St. Thomas, but he was unique in some ways in the 19th century in this idea of retrieving the fathers, bringing them to the church, and maybe most particularly himself and his writings at that time. Don't we, don't we find a greater reliance and appreciation of the, of the fathers in the Second Vatican Council? Yes. I mean, the great doctrines that Newman really rediscovered in his own time, which are now, of course, very much part of the Church's um, consciousness, but in his own time are very neglected. Well, what, we, what am I thinking of? Well, first of all, the resurrection. After all, the resurrection meant, did not, uh, the, 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 the resurrection for most Catholics, I suppose, and, and Protestants indeed, was seen as a kind of proof after the resurrection, that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. But, but of course, it's much more. Uh, Newman realized from the fathers, and he saw in St. Paul, that it's the resurrection that completes our redemption. That without the resurrection, everything is in vain. The recovery of the sense of the resurrection, that, that we are not just a Good Friday people, but that we are the Easter people. Mm -hmm. uh, a recovery of the sense of the Holy Spirit. That was very important. Newman got that in the Greek fathers. Mm -hmm. and, and, and alongside that, the whole idea of the sacramental principle. Mm -hmm. and above all else, the church as the sacrament of salvation. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, these, these are the kind of things that Newman recovered from the fathers and which are now very much, of course, part of our theology. The, the huge importance of baptism. We were, uh, we spoke in another, um, another bro broadcast about the, the importance of, of the magisterium, of revelation. Uh, could you talk a little bit about his, the importance uh, of Newman's insight into sacred scripture? Uh, in, in perhaps particularly that document in, of Revelation in the, the Second Vatican Council. Yes, I mean, Newman was one of the pioneers of trying to forge a new ki kind of Catholic theory of inspiration. Mm -hmm. He appreciated quite readily that, um, that the scriptures, which was after all presented such a problem to so many people in the 19th century, who thought that the books of the Old Testament, particularly Genesis, w was a sort of strictly historical or even scientific mm -hmm. account. And Newman saw quite clearly this was nonsense. Uh, these were theological religious documents and needed to be interpreted in that way. I'm not saying that Newman had the kind of view of scriptural inspiration exactly as we would have today, but, but, but what he did understand was that one had to read the documents in the light of the intention for which they were written, uh, and that one mustn't look at scripture. They were not intended. Um, they were intended. Genesis is fundamentally, if you like, a theological poem. It's, it's, a, mm. it's a theological statement, but put it within the terms of, of a symbolic statement. He would have been ha very happy with the advances in scriptural uh, exegesis and hermeneutics and the investigation in general, not necessarily with some of the results is poorly interpreted, but I, I think that would be the case. You know? Yes, except that he would, uh, I think he, was, he, he would be very worried about any lack, loss of that mystical sense of the scriptures, mm. which of course the fathers are so keen on. He would have been very worried that if we're going to simply have uh, a very uh, exegesis, either a very, he didn't want a very literal interpretation of scripture, but then neither did he want a very critical interpretation, that scripture was to be seen in this uh, mystical way. Uh, that is to say, it was to be seen, one was to understand the, the New Testament in terms of the unfolding of the Old Testament and understanding that there was a deeper significance behind so much of the, uh, of the writings of Scripture. We only have a few minutes left, and this is my last opportunity to be with you. Uh, how about John Paul II and John Henry Newman? Uh, certainly the Holy Father seems to be quite aware of him and have read quite a bit in him. Do you see any type of convergences in terms of their thought or the way they approach the church? Um, well, of course, Pope John Paul II is a phenomenologist and there's quite a lot of in common between phenomenology mm -hmm. and Newman's own philosophy of the mind. I, I'm afraid I can't say, I don't know whether, I don't know, I don't know enough about Pope John Paul II's interest in Newman. Um, I know that Pope Paul VI was very keen to canonize Newman because I think he saw Newman as being, as being the great figure behind the council but who also stood for tradition and loyalty to the church at a very confused and turbulent period in the church's history. But of course, um, the present pope, as a, as, a, as a very intellectual pope, is certainly must be very aware of Newman and the importance of canonizing somebody like him. Do you see any possibility of canonization coming down the line in, in a few years? Or do you think, uh, of course, it depends on God's providence and the divine intervention in some ways, but do you have any sense that perhaps he, he could be canonized within yes, our lifetime? Well, people often say to me, oh, well, surely Newman wouldn't bother about canonization. Well, mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I'm not saying, I don't think Newman would be interested in himself being canonized. Obviously, he wouldn't want to push that. But, but after all, canonization depends, beatification depends upon the prayer of intercession, doesn't it? It's people asking for his prayers. And Newman used to say that intercessory prayer was the most Christian of all prayers. And, the, and so I think Newman would think that any kind of intercessionary prayer is good. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it's all about. It's about getting people to pray mm -hmm. and have faith that the prayers are answered. Mm -hmm. From that point of view, I think Newman would thoroughly approve of, of attempts to canonize people because it brings the inter this power of intercessory prayer absolutely into very sharp focus, doesn't it? Yes. On a more personal note, as we begin to come to an end of uh, our time together, uh, could you ex explain briefly, if you would like, um, what has been the, the influence, not on the Second Vatican Council, but on Father Ian Carr, of, <laughs> who is the foremost expert and spent more time with John Henry Newman than probably any man in this century? Oh, I don't know about that. Um, well, I, I really began, isn't it my interest in Newman, began as a literary figure, and then, then I began to understand how, uh, what, a, what a wonderful thinker he was, and I began to get interested in theology as a result of Newman, reading Newman, which is no doubt why I'm sitting here mm -hmm. with this collar around my neck. Mm -hmm. so, but no, he's been a profound inspiration for me. Mm -hmm. And like for so many other people, he, uh, he's, I think he's, he's kept my faith alive and made it real to me. And as Monsignor Liddy, who has been one of our guests on this program, mm -hmm. mentioned during the turbulent times after the Second Vatican Council, for many people, it's been a test of faith. Uh, 
um, unfortunate in many reasons, for in many ways. But John Henry Newman really does stand as a beacon of, of conscience, of intellectual freedom, strong faith, strong piety, mm. loyalty to the church, I think, for all of us. Well, I want to give a, a special thanks to you for having traveled over mm -hmm. uh, from England in the midst of your busy pastoral and academic work to be with us here for the first time at the Eternal Word Television Network. And you've added immeasurably, we hope, to the success of the series. And we hope that you'll be able to come and visit us again. Well, thank you for asking me. I enjoyed and it. And I also want to thank the viewers for once again joining us with, the, with Father Ian Carr for this uh, another episode of this series. Uh, Newman at 2000 on the life, work, and thought of the Venerable John Henry Newman.